Welcome everyone to this week's episode of In the Know with Cat Bobino. Today my extra special guest is coming all the way from Florida and I want to welcome Dr. Chris Crawford. So welcome to the show, Chris. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. So can you tell us what your work is on? Okay. Um, so my work falls at the intersection of a field called brain-computer interfaces and human-centered computing. So to just say it in um, a summary, the stuff I work on is how do we uh, push forward the field of BCI technology from a human-centric perspective. So um, a lot of people are familiar with some of the traditional stuff um, that's, that's been done uh, in the medical side. And recently there's been an uh, increased amount of technology that you can kind of get off the shelf to uh, get into the area of, of brain computer interfaces. So my research investigates how can we leverage that, uh, these two fields together so that we can kind of bring this technology to the masses. Okay, so, so this work that you're doing, this, these things that we can pull off the shelf, are you saying that we have technology already that we interface with that medical doctors are using all the time, but now we just need to integrate it more or understand how we interact with it more? Or what are you saying with that? So um, basically we have devices um, that range from uh, a BCI device, a brain computer interface device that you can go buy at Target for between two and 400 bucks that can give you s readings um, of the same things, but of a lower quality. So if you go to a hospital and get me medical grade devices hooked up, you get more quality, but this is the first time we've even been able to kind of get this, um, this technology period in our home. So it's really exploratory. Um, you can't get medical grade analysis in your home, or if you do, it will look really weird. However, we're, <laughs> on the, we're, at, a, we're at a turning point in the technology uh, where people uh, ranging from Elon Musk to Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg actually just put out a release yesterday talking about the uh, four implications of the technology. Um, so it's not quite um, like you, it's just perfect and everything is well with the technology right now. But for the first time uh, in the history, to be honest, you can uh, get a device that can start to go down that road of leveraging um, your signals from your brain. Um, that's from a hardware perspective. I don't develop the hardware. Um, this hardware, like I said, you can go and buy it off the shelf, order it from Amazon. What I focus on mostly is how can we create software and that's really, that, that really serves as the interaction point between what kinds of application you can create and use that leverage these signals. Um, from the brain. So that's kind of where my work focuses more on the software and application side. Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, with the software that you are creating or possibly working on, this is software that can take that two, three hundred dollar equipment from Target but make it better and make it easier for you to get the information you need or is this software that hopefully in the future we'll be able to utilize? So I think the best way to understand the perspective or the angle uh, that I like to approach uh, BCI software in general is to think about your keyboard and your mouse, right? You have a keyboard and we've kind of got really comfortable with this concept of I can open up applications, software like Microsoft mm -hmm. Word and type, or type up, a, type up a, um, um, a paper and use the mouse. Right. It just comes second nature to us. But at some point in time, these word processing applications never existed. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we've always had kind of like things type to you had type is and you had the one where uh, typewriters even before you had digital displays. Right. So you always had the input device. Uh, however, over time, the software developed and evolved to make our jobs easier. So if you look at it, so, so what I like to do is say, think of the BCI device uh, similar to an input modality, similar to a mouse or keyboard. Um, right now, we don't really have the word processor application that matches the BCI technology. So how mm. can we 
how can we move the technology forward by leveraging the hardware that we have and finding new avenues on new types of applications to make our lives easier. Okay, okay. I can understand that. So basically, we, we have the hardware, we just don't have the software yet. And if yeah. that's what you're creating is that software. And we have software. Uh, mm -hmm. However, the software uh, over the past uh, couple of decades has been mainly targeted toward BCI experts, um, computer scientists or neuroscientists looking for specific things more in a research domain or specifically for um, some type of theoretical contribution. Um, with my background in kind of human-centered computing, we look at, okay, if we turn this from a user-centered perspective and talk about how we can design technology uh, to assist people in their everyday lives, and then you say, okay, what I want to do is make that as easy as possible. Then it leads you down the road of trying to, like I said, create that application that could potentially stand in the place of a word processor application in the field. So when it comes in the medical field and creating software that can help identify a problem or, you know, help someone figure out what's going on in their, their body, per se, um, how does that take away from the jobs or what people are doing in the medical field? For example, and I'm not even going to say that this is even remotely coming anytime soon, but, you know, what if you had the technology at home to do an x-ray of your arm? Then you wouldn't need x-ray technicians or the people who's in the hospital doing this. All you need is someone who can read the x-ray, right? So do you see that as like the future of what we can do with this type of software and technology? That's a very good point. Um, it, it, it reminds me of uh, uh, kind of the horse and carriage uh, phenomenon. You need someone, like, maybe right. everyone doesn't know how to drive horses and maybe people don't want to drive anymore. And, and to say that that isn't a real possibility, um, it could definitely happen on down the road. I think the first phase that you will see that it, you won't have a kind of this complete replacement of jobs. You'll just have things that make people jobs easier. So instead of kind of having to maybe work the equipment, you will have to work the assistant. You will have to work the equipment. Uh, you will have to work the applications that talk to the equipment through like this online process. So similar to what we're doing now, we're not physically in the same place. However, mm -hmm. we're we're communicating virtually. So you may talk to that same person, a technician, um, however, they may be miles and miles away and they may walk you through and say, okay, now put the device on mm -hmm. and then you, I see the readings. The, the field, the technical term for that is called telemedicine, right? So that's mm -hmm. one application. So I don't necessarily think that this technology is going to start replacing jobs and people are just going to be out on the streets. No, I think the way we go about it and the way we interact from a human to human interaction perspective may take on more of a distributed nature, if you will, since you have this technology at home. But I don't I don't think that um, uh, immediate job loss will be kind of a direct byproduct of that. OK, that's. That's understandable. I can see that. And uh, I didn't even realize telemedicine was a thing now, but I'm, I guess it is. I've seen commercials, especially out here with our Kaiser, you, where you, you can, will see it very soon. <laughs> I, I believe it. No, I've seen a commercial where you can now take a video or a photo of your ailment, send it to the doctor and the doctor can respond via email or text or however they respond. Um, and tell you either it's this, go get some ointment, or come in. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm not an expert in like <laughs> a medical expert or anything, but that's 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 how I I see the technology um, moving forward from a computer science perspective and a little that I do know about you know kind of the human aspect of it. Okay, I can see that. So then, what got you interested? And going into computer science, but also having this um, human, not human, but psycholo psychology or human anatomy version of going into computer science. Hmm. Uh, that's actually, if I kind of stumbled upon what I'm kind of focused on all right now, I started off doing robotics research um, at the University of Alabama. And I was an undergrad there. Uh, 
I had a professor, Monica Anderson, at the University of Alabama. I took her course. She said, hey, you should do research. I said, what's research? And she kind of <laughs> just showed me. Uh, she kind of showed me, and we were doing kind of uh, research with drones and um, all kinds of kind of applications and software to um, broaden particip- uh, participation in computer science and stuff like that. <clears throat> so I kind of... The, the way I actually got involved uh, in the research aspect of it, we're working, I also do kind of this human robot interaction research or brain robotic in- interaction research where we kind of take that same brain computer interface technology and, and investigate ways to leverage it with, ro- with robotics. And however, prior to that, uh, you know, I came, I declared a, a computer science major. I just like opening up computers. It's like this classic case of want, liking to tear <laughs> apart radios yeah. and computers and tinkering around. And the, the, the how I really got started with my interest in, in computer science is my, my aunt gave me a computer. She just gave me one of like an old computer just laying around in the garage. And it's like, hey, here's, you know, here's a computer. And I, I had it for a while. And then, like, something wrong happened. It crashed. And this was before you had, like, For, like, Google. Geek Squad? Yeah, Geek Squad. Yeah, yeah Geek Squad you was long after you can this. take it to. Yeah, it was long after Geek Squad. I, I want to say, at least where I was from, it was no such thing as Geek Squad. <laughs> Google wasn't really, like, a thing either. So I kind of just started hacking around in the terminal to try to format the drive and reinstall the operating system. And, and that kind of appealed to me. It was almost like a puzzle. And that was that was the very first time I knew or I had an idea about, oh, I think I might want to go deeper into this. Okay. So <clears throat> trying to fix your computer yourself and reformatting it, and then that in turn – when you went to college, you thought about robotics, though. You were I, I never thought about. I, actually, oh. I went when I went to college. I was just in. I was just programming. I was going with the flow. Um, and my teacher uh, asked, "Was I interested?" I guess she she thought that I was okay at programming. You must have been pretty had, good. Yeah, when she had, I don't know. She she <laughs> had a robotics program, and 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 that kind of got me started down the road that I think I'm I am right now yeah so like this road that you're on or this pathway it's a combination or interdisciplinary of computer science robotics and humor in human interface or psychology right is that the combo I'm sorry, you broke up. I heard oh, okay. at the very telling, I think you were saying the combination. So the combination is right now what I tend to focus on lies at the intersection of brain computer interfaces, which is the technology uh, capable of measuring electrical activity in your brain and human computer interaction, which re- deals with a host of things. But at the core, it uh, investigates um, uh, the interaction between humans uh, and technology. Um, that can take on a whole different, it can be, um, like I mentioned, user experience, mm-hmm. usability, however, um, user, usability, user experience, it, people think about, well, hey, if this, if this software, if I can do my job fast and quick is good, but also we want to think about, well, do I enjoy using this? So it kind of go, it has many, many layers, but at the core, you, you're going to evaluate these things from a human center perspective. So instead of just stuffing technology down your throat, first I want to talk to you about it and interview you. Hey, well, how, how do you normally handle this task? And then going from there and borrowing kind of these concepts from uh, the fields of like psychology, we go and say, how can we use similar processes to analyze uh, uh, a human's needs their mm-hmm. wants and how can we design the technology to directly address those things, which we found out by following concepts and methods that you would normally have in some type of psychology um, concept, context. Okay, so you're uh, including psychology into technology, talking to people, seeing how they interact with their own personal computers, laptops, 
tablets, whatever the case may be. But then you're also looking at the brain interface. So then that falls under the neuroscience or anatomy physiology side of it. Um, so have you taken a lot of courses in that or how does that intertwine into computer science? So a lot of, a lot of the work that I've done doesn't necessarily, or a lot of the coursework, let's step back. The courses for uh, specifically kind of the brain computer interface technology um, that I work on, it really is it's not a course. My, my, I had a colleague who taught a course uh, for the first time last semester. So he, he kind of sat down and said, okay, we need a course for this stuff and created it, right? <clears throat> However, this is not something you you can sit down in a in a course and learn the methods and the kind of the fund the, the fundamentals of kind of BCI technology. However, most of those courses right now will ultimately focus on the technology from a medical perspective. So it kind of takes us back to kind of where we where to we were. I think side. maybe even before, right? However, um, kind of the research I'm trying to craft and going about now is mostly I say a few researchers around the world are looking at, hey, how can we create these non-medical applications or how can we apply this technology uh, for non-medical application? That's not necessarily something I might teach a course on that uh, um, <laughs> when I <laughs> in the next uh, few semesters. However, that's not something that's. That's ultimately drafted now. So it's kind of, I will say it's, it's bleeding edge. The okay. technology has been around since the uh, early 1900s, but um, now we'll, we're seeing an emergence of hardware companies um, that's making it feasible to actually buy five of these devices and say, here, class, um, let's talk about how we can create these novel non-medical applications. And by the way, you can learn kind of the fundamentals of the technology. Uh, as you go. Um, but okay. for it, me personally, this wasn't something that was kind of uh, this organized curriculum that I learned. It, you, I kind of learned it as by reading uh, research papers, journal papers, and kind of talking and collaborating with colleagues. Okay. And um, so for me, I come from a science background, biology background, but mostly dealing with wildlife. And I know there's a lot of research dealing with human interactions, but we're starting to use more computers, more technology to identify um, things happening in the wild, you know, and identify things happening with the animals, how they're interacting with the climate, how they're interacting with, you know, soil, grasses, all of that stuff. And this may not be your field, but how do you see um, technology and how it can interact with our wildlife counterparts or how we can start using technology like this to help identify issues or create solutions to problems? I think, so um, it, it's a, it's the old saying, I, I can't, I, I, I'm ashamed I don't know it, but it's the 3Ds. <laughs> um, and I'll kind of talk more about my robotics works in this perspective. If you have things or tasks that are dangerous, dirty, or dull, right? So I can imagine you may be able to think or maybe uh, have cases where you would like to go to places where these animals are, but they may be a little too dangerous. Um, right. Or it may be places that you want to go that if you go, you'll get really dirty or, <laughs> or right. it could be dirty and dangerous. Um, and I think... Uh, technology could potentially uh, assist with um, sending out sensors or sensing whether it's um, camera fees or whether you're just trying to uh, measure some type of pH balance in the water or some type of environment or even uh, get assessments of the weather. Maybe you can have, uh, maybe there's things about the environment that you're interested in. And I think ultimately, and across all sciences, I'm pretty sure you need data. 
<laughs> right? right? So anywhere where you need data, I think it, you can sit down for a few minutes and start thinking about, or we could, me and you could sit down and you can talk, tell me some of the problems. I could say, well, we can maybe send this out and send that out and it'll give you your assessments on this and you can write it up and that's your scientific contribution. That's one of the things I've seen um, happen just being around interdisciplinary work. Uh, technology um, offers us, us the opportunity uh, to get data a lot of times that may be difficult otherwise. Right. I mean, and and speeds of, up the process of analyzing it as well. So, Yeah, one of the um, things that I've looked at before is um, GIS and using yes. GIS and using yes. that to identify changes in the um, atmosphere or changes in the earth. And like you said, some places could be dangerous. For example, you know, we have a small, or not a small, but a decreasing number of silverback gorillas. But some of the places they live is like the Dominican Republic of Congo, where it's very dangerous for foreigners to come into and try and do the research. Right. But right. I mean, exactly. you do need someone, even if you, like GIS is one thing, you, but mm -hmm. you do need someone, right, to go into the Congo first to put the cameras or to put the trackers on the gorillas, or to do... Oh, you could use a drone, but, you know, people <laughs> have different perspectives of drones. I don't want to go down that slippery <laughs> slope, however. Um, but you could you could use a drone in some of those cases. It's our, uh, there are researchers at the University of Texas A&M um, that worked on kind of going into these disaster zones of search and rescue robots. So there's a, there's a huge branch of, of robotics that works on exactly those cases so i okay. think with the with the use case that you you mentioned specifically that's the first thing that comes to to my mind about is that. using a drone well not okay. using a drone but just using any type of technology uh capable of sending back uh, some type of useful information for whatever problems or hypotheses or questions that you may have about a particular thing it can be a drone it could be um, aquatic robot, it could be a, a ground robot that crawls around. I mean, it it could be a, a host of things. But okay. um, yeah, it's it's a vast amount of opportunities for technology to help, like in a lot of play, in a lot of cases. Okay, so currently you are in Florida, and how did you just finish your PhD? I'm right. I'm in the middle of finishing right okay. now. <laughs> so, yeah. but which is right. really cool. Like you're almost done, but you've already secured a position at the University of Alabama. And yeah, um, it's, it's it public yet, but I guess it's public oh, now. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of public. My, but I, I got the shirt on. Yeah, I mean, oh, so. my apologies. <laughs> um, oh, so anyway. Um, <laughs> What are you planning on doing at the University of Alabama and what do you see foresee yourself researching and finding students? What do you want to do in, at the University of Alabama? So I, I definitely uh, intend to uh, continue evaluating um, this concept of using uh, mobile wearable BCI devices to assist us or to, to assist um, people in various uh, um, um, daily routines, whether it's kind of detecting drowsy driving or whether it's just kind of giving us a better idea of what type of um, mental or, or effective state we're in. Uh, I think those two things, that, that's research I began while I was here at the University of Florida, and there's a few things I want to, to continue. Uh, specifically, I'm excited about actually releasing a, a software platform aimed at uh, people who may not be computer scientists, who may not be very, very um, good at programming without kind of C++ and Java stuff. However, this platform is aimed at kind of lowering the barrier to entry, if you will, okay. to BCI. So instead of using text-based languages, you can use a visual interface to start, um, I just like to say, tinkering around with the technology and coming up with your own creations. And I look forward to releasing that and doing further research and um, modifications to that software platform. Um, those are the two things I know for sure. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and that I'm that I can kind of share right now. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, main, I'm mainly public. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it'll be in those kind of domains. Okay. Well, if you need a beta tester, because I am computer illiterate, and um, I know everyone needs to know technology in the future from here on out, like everybody needs to know something about technology. <laughs> so I, I need to be that person and start slow, I guess, or take it Awesome. We'll, we'll get you a BCI device sent out and, and you'll be able to load up the software from your phone and computer and and you can have at it. And as long you know, I need to learn anyway. I'm 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 willing to learn. I just know that I'm coming from a way low area. Of that's our target <laughs> audience. Yeah, that's yeah. It, it's funny. That's exactly who we're targeting. So okay, good. Great. And so um, we in our remaining time only have two more questions for you. The uh, question I'm gonna start with is. You know, what you're doing with your work is amazing and going into technology, but outside of this work and outside of um, getting ready to defend your your dissertation, what do you do for fun? What do you do outside of tech and outside of research? Um, so outside of research, so I have my acoustic. It's funny you ask because uh, I, I try to play the acoustic guitar. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I music uh, is kind of something that I I do outside of uh, my research. Nothing really serious. Um, you can go I, ahead and play like something if you want. It's out of tune. <laughs> I will, it's so out of tune. I'm, yeah, it'll take me time to tune it up. But um, so 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 yeah, I, I think that's one thing. Um, relax, man. It, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, relax. Music and relax is right now. That's kind of what I like to do. I like gaming and stuff, but a lot of times I'm developing games. So kind of you have this split right, between. Right, so you're, still, it's you're going back in tech. It's yeah. <laughs> so um, I and, and I do other things that people probably wouldn't think is like outside of work, but I think is outside of work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so but music would be that that one thing I think uh, that I like to do outside of work. Okay. And then the final question is, um, if there was someone interested in what you were doing or um, interested in learning more about it, like what advice would you give a student who possibly would want to follow your footsteps and do the same type of research? Oh, the same type of research? Or That's similar, interesting. similar research. Similar research. Okay. Similar research. The first step, I think, is learn how to program. Um, you, you get a lot of people. I have a bunch of friends who say, oh, I have this great idea. And they tell me the idea, and I say, yeah, I could do that. I don't have time to, but I could do it. However, if if you start early with learning how to program and you get to the point of you're, you're interested in STEM, learn how to uh, use the fundamental tools that, um, present to the world the the Facebooks, the the the, the Twitters, or it, it doesn't even have to be software. It can be hardware. You can get into uh, tinkering around with microprocessing boards like Arduino or something. A hacker, um, this whole ha hacker thing that's going on now. Um, get into some of that stuff. Learn the low level stuff because what, you, you know it's it's one thing to to be able to kind of say, oh, we could do this and we could do that. And it's a different thing to actually say, I'm about to do this and I'm up, I'm about to do that. And part of kind of how I am where I am today is because when that idea came, I knew how to apply it and make it into a real thing. So I think learn how to program, keep programming and have a creative mind. Um, if you combine strong technical skills from a programming perspective, with a highly creative mind, that's when you get some of your most innovative solutions. And everyone who I know personally and who I've read, who, who I read about, that has always been two key components that have served them very well. So that's what I would say. So if you're open and very creative, and um, or into STEM, or however the case may be, but just learning the program is something you would say. Yeah. That's that's the foreground. That's the foreground. Uh, you you, I mean that's 
learn if, if you to me people might say oh well you don't have to do that to 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 do or you can have a different route for me personally uh i had i got a very good understanding of how to do the technical stuff first and i like to say that i may be somewhat creative maybe not the most creative person <laughs> uh however i'm creative enough to dream up things and this, I can't des- describe the feeling of being able to dream something up and know exactly like, okay, I know exactly the tools to make that happen. I know, and I know how to apply it. Right. Um, if you get to that point, I think you'll do uh, really well for yourself. And, and no matter what route, whether you want to do a more entrepreneurial route, uh, stay in an academy like me, or uh, even go work for Fortune 500, you'll do anywhere you decide to land. If you kind of go with those two pillars, uh, I think I think you'll do well. Okay, so on that note, I'm gonna try and take some online programming classes because I always have ideas. I have absolutely no way of executing them because I don't know how to make an app or anything. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, yeah, it's, it's so, it's like a, you know, it, it, when they say programming languages, it's so real because if you think about, there, there's a lot of, lost knowledge that may if we go very here we go to his the history side there's a lot of lost knowledge uh that may that, that's maybe attributed to a failure to be able to um convert greek to latin or these people in this this country right. never got it or we never got this because it was written in a lost language and we don't know what it means right right i think that's the same thing where you have this idea and you need to know the language to actually express it, you know, from a tech technology. If it's a idea about technology, learning the language will help you express it to the world. And, and that's how you have to look at that uh, okay. for me personally. But I'm, I have a very biased opinion. I have a computer <laughs> background. <laughs> right. Uh, so other people may, um, and that's, and that's totally fine. But that's kind of how I look at it um, from my perspective. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time out tonight to being on the show because you're three hours away. So well, thank I, you for inviting me. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate um, you enlightening us on your very biased ideas of computer. Not just playing. Just you know, <laughs> sharing what you do. And so um, hopefully... If there's anyone out there who wants to learn more about what Dr. Crawford is doing, you can always send me a message. I will send it to him and, you know, try and do an introduction because we definitely want more people going into STEM and we want to encourage more of our youth going into STEM. So until next time.